A very good morning to our guest of honor, Professor Uttam Raj Bhandari, and a very good evening to the students, faculties of various institutions and the members of Indian Society of Human Genetics who could join us today. On the occasion of Azadi Kamrit Mahotsav, I, on behalf of Indian Society of Human Genetics, welcome you all to our online chat show on Genome Literacy Day through Chai Pe Charcha, a story untold, reminiscence of Quran. Today, we are celebrating 100th birth anniversary of Professor Hargobin Khurana. Professor Khurana indeed left an indelible mark in the minds of every researcher with his sheer grit and determination. This made us curious to know more on his life and science. To honor this occasion, we have one of his best revered friend, Professor Uttam Raj Pandari, who had been with him as a colleague till his last days in MIT. I'm extremely grateful to Professor Uttam Raj Bhandari, who agreed to grace the occasion in spite of his age and health. We had several series of interactions over the last couple of weeks. And I must say that for him, age is just a number. He is highly energetic, dynamic, and above all, extremely humble with very honest expressions there. Sir, in Indian Society of Human Genetics, we decided to celebrate Professor Khurana's birthday as a Genome Literacy Day. As you know that literacy means ability to read or write a language. Similarly, the genome literacy would mean ability to write and read the language of life. And every language needs a script, and so does the language of genome. And these scripts are the alphabets, and alphabets of the language in the appropriate combination make a word. And these words in right combination make a sentence. Similarly, the alphabets of life are made up of A, T, G, and C, which in appropriate combination make codons, which are considered as the word of life. And these codons in right combination make a protein or the language of life. This language of life was discovered by Professor Hargobin Khurana. He even went on to define how to start a sentence or how to stop a sentence, which is referred as start codon or stop codon of a protein. So with this introduction, of the type of the topic today, I would request my colleague to introduce uh, Professor Uttam Raj Bhandari, who is the guest of honor today. So thank you very much. Good evening, all. Professor Uttam Lal Raj Bhandari, more popularly known as Tom, originally hails from Nepal, who completed his graduation and post graduation from India with flying colors. After completing his bachelor's degree, he received a Colombo Plan Scholarship to pursue MSc degree in chemistry at Presidency College, which is now the Presidency University. He received the University of Calcutta gold medal for his master's, and subsequently he went to King's College, University of Durham, which is now the Newcastle, England with another Colombo Plan Scholarship to do his PhD with a notable biochemist, Sir James Badley. From UK, he moved to Wisconsin, where he got the opportunity to work with the Nobel laureate, Professor Haragobin Khurana in 1962. Here, he served as a faculty till 1969, and in the same year, he moved to Massachusetts Institutes of Technology, where he served in various capacities. Presently, he is a Lester Wolf Professor Emeritus of Molecular Biology in the Department of Biology at MIT. His bonding with Professor Khurana started in Wisconsin, flourished in MIT, which grew with every passing year till his last day in 2011. Professor Khurana is very strongly bonded in his memories, and he very passionately writes and speaks of, uh, on Professor Khurana of his infectious determination to achieve. 
Professor Uttam Laraj Bhandari research was focused on studying nucleic acids and nucleic acid protein interactions which play a crucial role in gene expression, gene regulation and development using biochemical and genetic approaches. With the aid of various analysis methods, he examined tRNA structure, function and biosynthesis. Professor Uttam Laraj Bhandari is a fellow of American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He had been in the advisory committee of American Cancer Society, National Institute of Health and American Society of Biological Chemists in various capacities. He was also in scientific advisory board of Reptigen Corporation and Ambergen. Today, we'll get to know many unknown facets of Professor Khurana and his journey of success. We are very happy to welcome you, sir. So first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Banerjee, for asking me to do this. Thank you, Samyukta, for the introduction. And it's really a great honor for me to be asked to participate in the centennial birthday celebration of the late Professor Hargobind Karana, one of the great scientists of the 20th century. I first met Gobind, as Samyukta said, in 1962, that's 60 years ago, when I joined his laboratory as a postdoctoral associate. And I've had the privilege of knowing him and working closely with him for a period of almost 50 years before he passed away. So I was at Wisconsin with him, and as Samyukta said, then uh, we both went to MIT. And at MIT, our offices were right across the hall from one another. Our labs were adjacent. Although we worked on different problems, our labs worked together as a unit. We had joint lab meetings and joint seminars. So I really got to know uh, Gobind. I hope oh, you don't mind, audience won't mind me saying Gobind. That's the first name because that's how he always wanted to be called. We always always called him Gold. So please forgive me for using that. So at MIT, as I said, our offices were right next to one another. We both worked very, very closely all these years. So I got to know him and people in his lab very, very well. And in, in the process of it, of course, I came to admire Gobind greatly as a mentor, a scientist, a colleague, and a very dear friend. And Gobin has contributed so much to science and he has had so much wisdom and, and ideas to impart that spending a day uh, with Gobin was really a day of inspiration. So it was a, a, a day of inspiration every day of my life, literally. So it was really, really a very, very pleasant uh, experience knowing him. And you know, many times he called me, you know, we're like brothers. And we, we all, we were we became almost like brothers. So with that, then I know, I think I, if you can ask me any question. Yes. Hello, sir. It's a, uh, indeed a great honor to ha have this chat with you. So can you tell us about uh, Professor Karana's early years in life and in research? Yes. So uh, his early years in life, uh, Gobind had a very humble beginning. He was born in uh, uh, Raipur, uh, a very small village of approximately 100 families in the Multan district of Punjab in what is now Pakistan and at, but at that time was India. And so he had a humble beginning uh, in a village of approximately 100 people, Raipur had about 100 families, as I said, and his was the only literate family. His father was a, a, a taxation clerk, a patwari, as Gobind used to tell, say, patwari, a, a taxation clerk, um, lowly uh, in pay. But one thing he had was that he believed in education for himself and his children. So the school, early years of school for Gobind were essentially non-existent. There was no building for his school. School was basically under a tree, sitting under a tree and learning from whoever was teaching. Uh, so it was not a good, not a very good beginning, but he was lucky in the sense that his father believed in education and his father imparted on, on the children uh, uh, all the education that they had in the early years. But through good luck, attempts, 
you know, all the hard work and all that. Gobin got to the uh, high school, got a high school, uh, uh, passed the high school test, and then got into Lahore, uh, you know, Punjab University uh, in Lahore. And that's where his scientific beginnings were in Punjab uh, University in Lahore. So um, I, what, what I would like to do is to show you his chronology of his scientific journey. Okay, so let me do that. And let me see now what I do here. More share screen. Okay. All right. All right, can... Yes, we can, can see everybody this. see this? Yes. This is the uh, early journey of Govin. It all started in Lahore, Punjab University. And he uh, got a BSc and an MSc from Punjab. Uh, uh, university in Lahore, 1943 to 1945 in chemistry. And from there, he was fortunate uh, in having been selected by the agriculture ministry at that time to go to England for a PhD degree. And I'll tell you, there's an interesting story on how he got to Liverpool, UK for his PhD degree. He was slated, it was slated that he would go there to study, it goes not in Liverpool, somewhere else, to study insecticides because the Ministry of Agriculture felt that they will be needed to learn more about insecticides, they want to train people. So he was supposed to go to England in some place called Berkshire. Oh, okay. All right, yeah, so, uh, so he went to Liverpool uh, uh, because the, uh, at that time, it was just at the end of the Second World War, um, all the troops were coming back to England and the universities were completely full and crowded. So in, he could not go to study insecticides. So Indian High Commission at that time decided that since he had a degree in organic chemistry, he might as well go and get a PhD in organic chemistry rather than study insecticides and fungicides. So that is how he got to, this is, you, you can call it fate, you can call it luck, whatever it will, it will turn out to be that he was lucky eventually to go to Liverpool to get a PhD in organic chemistry. And from Liverpool, after finishing a PhD in organic chemistry, Gobin went to Zurich for a postdoctoral work, just for one year of postdoctoral work. And I'll tell you a very interesting story about how he got there and how his one year at Zurich was really, really very fruitful for him scientifically. And from there, he came back after one year in Zurich as a postdoctoral research, doing postdoctoral research. He came, went back to India to get a job. Unfortunately, at that time, this was 1948, I think it was, or 49 maybe. Soon after uh, independence, India was in turmoil, it had been in a split into India and Pakistan. His family in pa Pakistan, what was, became Pakistan, left to go to India, so you know, it was disrupted. Family was disrupted, they went to India. And so he could not find a job in spite of his PhD degree from England and, uh, uh, and uh, his postdoctoral work at, uh, in Switzerland. Uh, so after Switzerland, he then fortunately he had found a friend in Switzerland in the same lab where he was. And that person had gone back to Cam Cambridge and he, he, they were corresponding to one another. And that person said, why don't you come to Cambridge? And that's really how he got a fellowship to go to work in Cambridge for a second postdoctoral stint, postdoctoral research in the laboratory of uh, Alexander Todd, who is famous person, Professor Sir Alexander Todd, became Lord Todd, also won a Nobel Prize in chemistry for his work on nucleotides. So he was there for three years. And after three years, he uh, got an interview to go to get a job. He found, uh, again, I'll tell you a story about how he got the interview and how he got the job to go to Vancouver. And Vancouver was where you know, University of British Columbia in Canada. And that is where his first independent research began. This is, this is the beginning of his real scientific contributions. 
you know, before that was all training and doing good work, but, but basically getting trained. And there he became very famous for using organic chemistry to solve important problems in biology. Like at that time, you know, organic chemistry was a lot of chemical synthesis and he learned that and he used that very successfully to synthesize many, many important biochemical molecules, which were very difficult to get hold of at that time. So because of that, he became very well known to biochemists. Many, many biochemists came to work in his lab. Famous biochemists came to work in his lab for the summer. People like Arthur Kornberg, Nobel Prize winner, DNA replication person, Paul Berg, also a Nobel Prize winner in cloning and things like that. So he, so many, many people flocked to his lab to work. And he became already famous there for his work on nucleotides, nucleotide coenzymes, and he was beginning to start some work on synthesizing DNA oligonucleotides chemically. All the, again, using a reagent that I'll tell you about that he got all the, or learned about in Zurich. All right, and from Vancouver, he, after a few years there, he came to Madison, Wisconsin. And in Madison, Wisconsin is where he did his work on the genetic code. He established the genetic code that Dr. Banerjee mentioned, Professor Banerjee mentioned. So uh, after establishing genetic code, he was not content with that. You know, he got the Nobel Prize for that, but very soon after that, he initiated studies on gene synthesis. He was he's such a, a, a real uh, a person in terms of thinking of new things to do always, that he began to work on gene synthesis at a time when the sequence of no gene was known. No gene had ever been isolated, and yet he was thinking of chemical synthesis of genes at that time. And from there, after a few years in Madison, he, I, 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 as I mentioned before, I worked with him there, and we both went to Cambridge and MIT. Yeah, and so that's where he spent the rest of his career. That's okay. That's, now that's really very interesting there. So I was just yeah. curious um, because I think you said in two places occasion. One is about his move, uh, moving to uh, uh, UK was a very interesting story. Yeah. A small story is there. And similarly, yeah. about his moving to Vancouver, also there's a small it's story. There. Can you just yes. narrate on that? Yes. So I can actually narrate it in terms of uh, what Gobin actually wrote. Okay. All right. Eteha to Cambridge to Vancouver. All right. Mm -hmm. can, you see, can you see it? Yeah, yeah, we can see it, yeah. All right. I arrived back in England in late December 1949. This is after uh, going to India and not getting a job. Three years later, I was looking hard for a job virtually anywhere in any country. Gordon Strum of the University of British Columbia, Canada, had also taken on the job of the directorship of the British Research Council, Vancouver, that year. Strum was visiting the UK and other countries to recruit people for UBC and for the research council as well. I was interviewed by him. I didn't know exactly where Vancouver was, <laughs> but I agreed to go there if Strom would offer me a job. Gordon Strom had obtained a small grant and wanted to see some fundamental research started there. Gordon Strom, who is a physicist by training, also told me quite candidly that he was looking for an organic chemist because he thought that organic chemical research was the cheapest to carry out, requiring only test tubes. Hmm. <clears throat> so in spite of this, what Gordon Strom told him, that, you know, uh, you, you can have all the, all the uh, freedom you want, but I can't give you much, right? In spite of that, uh, Karana went to Vancouver. Okay, actually, had, he said he looked at the map to see where Vancouver was, hmm. uh, and then went to Vancouver and established a fabulous research group. Where, where famous, famous biochemists from all over the United States, Nobel Prize winners would come to his lab to learn things. And if people, uh, for people who have, know of Arthur Kornberg's work, Arthur Kornberg started a field of, uh, of DNA replication, entire field of DNA replication. He discovered DNA polymerase. And when Arthur went to Govin's lab, he learned to synthesize DNA uh, nucleoside triphosphates. Nucleoside triphosphates are the substrates for DNA polymerase. So he went to work with Govin to learn to synthesize nucleoside triphosphates, took it back and used it for his own work on DNA replication. 
and he also got the Nobel Prize for his work on DNA replication. So things like that. And I'll show you some slides of Arthur and him as friends and as, you know, as, uh, just, just generally, I have some slides later on, I'll show you. Yeah, so in fact, that also comes to our next question. I think I'll ask someone else to ask. Professor Parana's major scientific accomplishments and what oh, was your impact in biology? Okay, yes. So basically, you know, Gobin really did so much work uh, that he was really a pioneer and a visionary, you know, things. So he was trained in chemistry, but he really decided early on um, at Vancouver that he really wanted to use chemistry to solve important problems in biology, right? So he wanted to use chemistry to, uh, to solve problems in biology. And by doing so, he started the field of chemical biology. So field of chemical biology was started by Gobin. That's one of his major, major accomplishments to show that chemistry can be used for many, many important purposes. So his work led to the elucidation of genetic code, as I mentioned, one of the one of fundamental mysteries of life that Professor Banerjee mentioned, you know, the, uh, and he got a Nobel Prize for that. And I'll show you the Nobel Prize ceremony here. Uh, yeah, here is him getting the Nobel Prize with uh, the king from the King of Sweden, right? This was in 1968. But at that time, he had, had already, he was already thinking, he already started, actually, I'm sorry, he already started beginning to work on the gene synthesis. But I mentioned to you that no gene had ever been synthesized or isolated or characterized. So how can you synthesize a gene, right? It turned out that uh, uh, the only RNA that was sequenced at that time was a tRNA, something called a tRNA. tRNAs play a very critical role in gene, in protein synthesis, where the codons in the messenger RNA are read to make proteins. So tRNAs are the intermediary, adapt, what's called adapters. So now the one tRNA gene uh, uh, sequence was known and the person who sequenced that tRNA also got the Nobel Prize at the same time as Gobin. They shared the Nobel Prize, which name is Bob Holly. Okay, so since the genes, RNA sequence was known, then he decided that, well, we can surmise what the gene sequence must be based on the RNA, right? And so that's how he synthesized the first gene, the gene for a transfer RNA. And that again came from his ability to synthesize small DNA oligonucleotides of known sequence. Yeah, he used the, the source, similar types of DNA oligonucleotides to solve the genetic code. Now he also used small DNA oligonucleotides to um, synthesize the small oligonucleotides and put them together using an enzyme called DNA ligase to make the entire gene. And so that entire gene was, um, the paper was published here. This was the first time a gene had been uh, uh, synthesized by anybody. The paper is published here in Nature. And I can tell, I have to tell you one more thing about about this paper. is here, this is a summary paper. It summarizes everything that was achieved, but the details of that work are published in the entire issue of Journal of Molecular Biology, 13 papers, back to back to back, an entire issue of one journal. And that journal, it was called Journal of Molecular Biology. It was the top journal at that time. It's like what people think in biology of science, nature, and cell as the top papers now. But at that time, Journal of Molecular Biology was the top journal and Govin's lab published 13 papers back to back on one issue of the journal based on this work. So this was such an important piece of work. That is, so to answer the question of the, of, of the other question, what were some of the major accomplishments? This would have to be called a major, major accomplishment. And I will say that, and then he followed that when he went to MIT, he followed that with the synthesis of another a transfer RNA gene, which, which you could then put into a cell and show that it was actually functional. So this was the first time a synthetic gene had been shown to be functional inside a living organism. And this is pro, uh, it's essentially a landmark in genetics. So this is another major, major accomplishment, right? So, and so, so, so that's a, now I think there are many other accomplishments. 
at the at at, at the pinnacle of his uh, uh, you know uh, accomplishments at the top of when when he was at the top of his game basically you know he decided to switch fields he switched from nucleic acid working on nucleic acids to membranes and membrane proteins an extremely extremely difficult job because membrane proteins are among the most different difficult proteins to work with and, and he worked with a uh, a light-driven proton pump called bacterial rhodopsin and a visual protein called rhodopsin, two proteins that are both membrane proteins. And he did a phenomenal job in there too. And it, he, he basically opened up the entire field of membrane proteins. He showed that you could denature a membrane protein completely, get rid of all the components, all the lipids and everything that comes with it, get rid of it, denature it is completely inactive and then reconstitute it and reactivate it and the molecule is active and this is the first time that had ever been done with a membrane protein people who work with membrane proteins said it would be impossible to do and it did it and showed that it could be done and what that did was to basically you could then make a protein in a cell uh, make any mutant protein in a cell denature it activated and then studied the effect of that particular mutation on the activity of the protein. So that in, opened up the entire field of membrane protein uh, genetics, really. And so that is another of his major accomplishments. And he's basically spent the last, oh, I would say 20, 70, 30, 30 years of his life working on membranes and membrane proteins. He published almost 200 papers on, on, uh, in that area. And it's absolutely you know, trailblazing work on membrane proteins too. So those are the major, major accomplishments. And th the other major accomplishment is Gobin was <clears throat> a pioneer and he's also a visionary. You know, he was always thinking of things way, way below, uh, beyond what anybody else would have been thinking. Gene synthesis was one such thing. Uh, membrane proteins was another thing. Now. And the third thing that Gobin did was once he had synthesized this gene for this alanine transfer RNA, <clears throat> now the question is, how do you make more of it? You know, when you, when you chemically synthesize an oligo, an oligonucleotide and put them all together to make a longer gene, longer DNA, you got it, okay. But you, got very, you end up with very, very small amounts of it. How do you make more of it so you can then study it, you know, uh, uh, things like that. And he was thinking, and he already in a paper said how he would do it. So this is the gene that had been made, right? So he said, what I'll do is the following. I will denature it. I will separate the two strands of that DNA, right? And then I'll add what's called primers. The primers will bind to the ends of the two strands, like that. And then I'll add DNA polymerase to extend it, right? And DNA polymerase will extend it. And what you have is two molecules of the same molecule. Right, and so if you do that, you get from one to two to four to eight to sixteen to thirty-two, and you have amplification DNA amplification. This is exactly what PCR is. Long, long, long time before PCR had been discovered. So if you talk to any anybody in the, who knows the field, they will say that many people are disappointed that Gobin did not get a second Nobel Prize for that. PCR work because without without the method for, first of all without the method for DNA oligonucleotide synthesis without the availability of DNA oligonucleotides that people can just call in and order these days and, and get it in the mail right PCR would not have been possible number one and number two is the idea for PCR was already here published years before PCR was you know used by somebody else. So people were disappointed, you know. even though the guy who got the PCR, there was another guy who got a PCR, uh, Nobel Prize at the same time. And that guy got got Nobel Prize for another work, but they were given jointly in, in the so-called chemistry section of uh, the Nobel Prize, Mike Smith. Even though Mike was himself a student of Govins, Mike was a student. So one of his students also won, went on to win the Nobel Prize, Mike Smith but for a different type of work. So it's called site-specific mutagenesis. Mike trained with Govin in Vancouver, and he did, he was the guy who synthesized, used Govin's methods to synthesize nucleotides 
DNA, uh, nucleoside triphosphates, first nucleoside triphosphates. And he, he also got a Nobel Prize. So Goldman is happy that one of his guys got the Nobel Prize. But most people would say, <coughs> excuse me, that Gobind should have been included for that. So that is another of his accomplishments, I would say. Yeah. So that it's, it's really, and, and then the other thing, of course, is that we, 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 much of biology that we do now, DNA forensics, DNA chips, all the things that people use you know, on a regular basis, even, even mRNA vaccines, mRNA vaccines would not have been possible if Gobind had shown how, had not shown how to, you can assemble short oligonucleotides into a long DNA and that the long DNA can be a gene. And Gobind used that not only for the tRNA work, he did later on use it for making bacterial opsin gene, rhodopsin gene, for instance, starting from small oligonucleotides. So without the use of oligonucleotides to synthesize the whole genes, the whole idea of mRNA vaccines would not be there, right? So you have mRNA vaccines come because you can synthesize genes for the uh, uh, mRNA. So the, uh, did I answer the question to the satisfaction? Uh, yes, yes, yes. In fact, it was yeah. uh, not only that, you had actually be, uh, gone beyond even about uh, telling about uh, the, 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 the discovery of PCR and, and also why he should have been credited for the PCR discovery. And similarly about the, uh, uh, the presently most discussed issue is about the mRNA vaccines. So yeah. actually the background of mRNA vaccine was also possibly provided by him there, it looks like. Oh, exactly. No, no, no. Yeah, it's because without the, he, sure, he, when he was working with bacterial rhodopsin, uh, rhodopsin, he synthesized the genes for those. Right. And he could make mutations, as he was synthesizing the gene, he could make mutations and put them, put them into the organisms. And then he could isolate the mutant proteins and study it. And he did that for many, 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 many you know, mutants. So that's interesting. So I, uh, the, I think that, and that really uh, takes us to our next question. So I'll ask uh, someone else. What, ask uh, yeah. Yeah. Who's going to ask? S sir, it was, uh, it was great to hear about Professor Corona's major contribution to science. So what do you think made him so successful in research? Yes. As that's an interesting question, yeah. Uh, I would say that, you know, coming from the uh, very humble beginnings that he did, uh, he did not have the benefit of, a, of an uh, education in Eton or, or, or Oxford. He didn't go to Eton or Oxford, right? Uh, and so, uh, and uh, I, I, you, you wouldn't say that he was born a genius. So, but, and yet he was incredibly successful. You know, how somebody who grew up under such humble circumstances could rise to be an icon of molecular biology and be one of, would be one of the great scientists of the 20th century is really uh, a, a very interesting question that you raised. And uh, the uh, thing is that, you know, I think it's, to me, uh, the way I see it is that some people might call it luck and, you know, I don't know. But to me, it's, it's really a testament to the, his extraordinary drive, discipline, focus, and a strong sense of being determined. And he's striving for excellence in everything that he did. So all of these combined to make him so successful in, 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 in science, really. And I can provide you with several examples of that. And I'll, I'll give you actually some interesting examples of that. The question is, why did he end up, why and how did he end up at the, at the Swiss Institute of Technology, Federal Institute of Technology, uh, for his po first postdoctoral work? When he was in Liverpool doing his PhD research in chemistry, at that time, there, there were only few chemical journals that were good. There was a journal of chemical society published in London, journal of American chemical society published in, in the States, and then many, many other journals published in Germany, German language. There's French also, of course, but the German language. And he realized, Govin realized that um, uh, many of these papers are in German. 
So he really want, was intrigued by it and wanted to really uh, get to learn the German language. So when he finished his degree in Liverpool, he decided that he would go, he would, he would do a postdoctoral work in a German laboratory, German speaking laboratory. So what did he do? He was determined to do that. He was determined to learn, learn German because he wanted to really follow chemical literature carefully in a way. So he went to Switzerland, ended up, uh, basically walked up to the uh, laboratory of uh, Vladimir Prelog at the Swiss uh, Institute of Technology, it's called ETH, E-T-H. went there and uh, literally begged for uh, some space to be allowed to work in his lab. Now, nobody had written any letters of recommendation from Liverpool, nothing. All he had, had was his PhD thesis. And, uh, and uh, so this is, this is what he did. Uh, this is his, now I show, show his determination here. I arrived in Zurich one day in late summer 1948. I left my luggage at the railway station, took my PhD thesis with me and went looking for Professor Prelog. He had no idea then that an Indian student was about to approach him to plead for a little space in his laboratory. No one from Liverpool had sent out any letter of introduction or recommendation on my behalf. When I met Professor Prelog, I found him so accessible that I immediately lost all fear. I requested that he might look at my PhD thesis. This was an organic nitrogen compound and alkaloids. And I would come back the next day to ask if he would accept me. Next day, Professor Prelog, with his typical enthusiastic and encouraging smile, said yes. And at my excitement added that he was glad to see people happy. Looking back now over the years, I believe that spending a year at the ETH with Professor Prelog is probably the wisest thing I ever did in my life. So this is how he ended up at the ETH. The ETH is a very, very famous institute in Switzerland, right? So um, why did Prelog accept him? We don't know, but obviously, you know, his thesis must have had something to do with it because he, he had left his thesis with Prelog. Prelog looked at it and was impressed enough to accept him. Now, Gobin was there for only 11 months in the lab. And, you know, 11 months is not a long time to spend in, as a postdoctoral fellow in a lab, but you could only afford to spend 11 months there because he was not paid. He was not being paid uh, to work there. He had to use the funds that he had saved from his students' days in Liverpool. And he had enough money only for spending a year or less than a year. So that's how determined he was. He was going to get a postdoctoral training in general lab, and this was it. So that's how he ended up with Prelog. He published two papers in German in a journal called Helvetica Chemica Acta. Yeah. And so that's, that says how determined he is and how he, you know, he, he tries hard to do whatever he wants to do. And now, the, I say that you know, this became the, uh, he was very happy with Prelog. He, he, he said here, yeah, Vladimir Prelog made me see beauty in chemistry, work and effort. That's what he said. You know, he was so impressed with Prelog's life. Prelog himself went on to win the Nobel Prize uh, long after Gobin got his own, but he, Prelog was also a Nobel Prize winner in chemistry. Yeah, so, so that's really, uh, now, the, this, this, the, the stay at Prelog, at the high, was going, had a monumental effect on him, another monumental effect on Gobin. And that was basically, it, it, influenced his research efforts for years to come. Oh, everything that he did in Vancouver, uh, uh, Vancouver, uh, uh, Wisconsin, MIT, was influenced by that work in that Because in trying to really learn German well, to speak in German, give seminars in German, and talk to in German in, about science with the German, uh, with the uh, German speaking uh, people in Prelog's lab, he was reading at nights, he was going to the library and he was reading German journals and translating them to English. And it was in the process of doing that, that he came across a chemical compound called, chemical class of chemical compounds called carbodiamides. 
And carbodiamides, uh, organic chemists had worked uh, in the in 1870. That's uh, almost almost 100 years before. But it had been basically ignored and not really used as a reagent by much by organic chemists. So it was basically unknown to most organic chemists. And he came across that reagent and saw its properties and said, ha, this is going to be, it could be of interest to my, my, to my work, in my work. And so that is how he used this compound called carbodiamides, which I show here, simple compound dicyclohexyl carbodiamide. That was the reagent he used to make nucleotide, nucleotides, nucleotide coenzymes, DNA oligonucleotides, and everything that came after that. So that it was a really phenomenal uh, reagent. That also was the reagent that he used in, in Cambridge. When he, when he went to Cambridge, remember his second postdoctoral work, he was spent in Cambridge. He had read about this and he mentioned this and he said, I'm gonna use this and he used it. And it surprised everybody in Todd's lab. It, they, it was so good at what they, what they wanted to do. And it, it, Govin actually says that it caused a lot of excitement in, the, in one of his writings says it caused a lot of excitement in Cambridge when he used that reagent as um, to synthesize nucleoside, uh, nucleotide coenzymes. So that was, so this is an outcome from of his sheer determination to learn the German language. And out of that came this reagent and this reagent really literally helped propel him through everything that he did in the research for years to come. So actually, Professor, uh, you have raised two very important issues. One is that uh, what uh, 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 <coughs> Professor Kurana uh, actually uh, believed that it is not about the institution, but it is about the uh, the, uh, the mentor, which matters a lot. Yeah. And subsequently, wherever he went worked with, almost all his mentors went on to get the Nobel Prize. There, whether it is Prula Prelog, whether it is Todd, everyone went on to get the uh, uh, Nobel yeah. Prize. There. Yeah. In, in, irrespective of that, they are not coming from a very high end institution. But these people were built up the institution there. So that was a very interesting uh, uh, dimension that you brought into uh, as a mentor there. And that also brings to our next query. How was he as a mentor to students and postdoctoral researchers in Islam? Okay, I'll, I'll definitely answer that question. And, uh, uh, but before I do that, can I go through one sure, more, sure, one sure. more point? Sure. About, about, I, know, I think people have to realize that if, he was a very determined person and he wanted to, he was ready, he was always striving for excellence in everything that he did. Yeah. And he wanted to be the best. He said, don't worry about what you know or what you don't know. Just do the best with what you know. Yeah, that was his philosophy in life. And uh, so he was also aware early in his research career in Liverpool when he was a student that he had some shortcomings, he had some weaknesses, he knew that. And one of his <coughs> weaknesses was that because of his background, you know, growing up in a small village in, 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 in India, in, at that time, India, that he, had, he lacked the verbal skills that he needed to communicate effectively about science. And in science, you know, if you can't communicate, if you can't talk to your lab mate or partner or to your boss or to, to an audience about the science that you're doing, if you can't communicate effectively, then you basically are not very, won't be very good at it, right? So he knew he had to improve on it. And what did he do to improve on that? Well, in Liverpool, you know, and it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of norm that you know, in a lab, the lab mates would all go out together to eat uh, you know, uh, you know, at, uh, at a pub usually, at a pub, but to eat. Uh, and that was a norm, normal thing to do. So on Friday nights, when everybody else would go out together to eat and you know just just be friends uh, uh, away from the lab, that he would go home to his apartment, very cold apartment, as he said. You know he had to feed uh, just a gas meter that that you have put shillings to coins to, and then when you put a coin, the gas comes on, and then the gas uh, heats, heats the room and that kind of stuff. So he said that he had to do that. <clears throat> and he did that every Friday night and this, to listen to the BBC Radio 3rd program. And BBC Radio 3rd program used to have all kinds of um, programs of interest at that time. 
and I don't know if it does still does now. And so, so basically to learn how to speak slowly, how to speak properly English, and how to speak and how to speak without an accent, how to enunciate the words and things like that. So he learned that and he did that religiously. He was just easy. When he wants to try to do something, he will do it, right? And as a result, you know, he's an outstanding writer. He's an outstanding speaker. And you know, pe people who have written papers with him, I have, many other of his uh, students have, have written papers with him and they, they say that it's, it's an eye opener, basically. And they're learning how to write. And so, uh, and he's a tremendous speaker at, at, at meetings and things like that. And even, even you know, uh, in, in, at MIT and at, in Wisconsin, when people would come for interviews to join his lab, or after joining his lab would give seminars, talks. You know, we had many, many, many uh, seminars or talks, lab talks. And he would admonish people if they spoke too, too, too quickly or, or, you know, uh, or just too, uh, just not able to understand. And so you say, please speak slowly or please just slow, slow down because I didn't get a thing there, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> and so, so he, he really wanted to teach people how to really be effective in communicating. Whatever he learns, he will come, you know, you'll make sure that you learn too. All right, so that's really it. So that was the point I wanted to make. So now, as a mentor, Gobin was a terrific mentor. I mean, he, he set high standards. You know, he uh, really had, you know, he, I, I think I have a slide, I'll show you this because it's, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a motto in life. Yeah, he set high standards and he could be quite demanding, but he was no more so of others as he was of himself in terms of being demanding. He wanted people to be interested in what they were doing. And he wanted people to do a good job in what they were doing. Do the best that you can is all I ask, he would say. By, by working closely with members of his group, either on a one-on-one -on -one basis or with a group, he set examples that they could follow. But he would, you know, he always did by setting examples. And let me show you this, this I've already done. Yeah, this is an example. This is, his, he was during the ways, during the days before genetic code was established. Here he is shown doing his own experiments using a mouse pipette that we're not allowed to do anymore. Yeah, using a mouse pipette of radioactive compounds we're not allowed to do anymore. That he was assaying for DNA polymerase. Why DNA polymerase? Because he had gone to Arthur Kornberg's lab and learned how to purify DNA polymerase and brought it back to his lab. And he was using these short oligonucleotides that he had chemically synthesized to amplify, uh, I don't have it here, okay. To amplify into DNA, big DNA. And that big DNA would then be transcribed into RNA, messenger RNA, and the messenger RNA would then be read into proteins. That's how the genetic code was established, right? By using his approach. And this is how he, he, he himself worked on converting the short synthetic DNA oligonucleotides into long DNA molecules by using DNA polymerase. And this is him doing his experiment. So he's really taught people more by example than by telling them what to do. Right? Like, you know, he would do, and he would do this work, he would give a seminar himself to the group and he would be subject to criticisms, questions, whatever have you. So that's what, he, he, and, and his associates, his mentees always said that, you know, writing a paper with Gobin was a real learning experience. He was, you know, he was always so meticulous because it's not a first draft or the second draft. He would write about eight, nine, 10 drafts until he was satisfied. And the perfection was something that he really, really striked for. And he expected people to also do a good job, not just be, you know, uh, yeah, so this is a, <laughs> so this is a list of his his mottos, if you like. I no, just things that you would expect people to be: be determined and self-motivated, be bold, aim high, and I think he had something that says, uh, "Okay, no, don't have it. Okay, be disciplined and work hard. Always do your best. Stay focused. Yeah, 
don't just move from pro pro project to project to project to project. If you have an interesting project, if you have selected a good project, stay with it, no matter how hard it is, stay with it. Plan carefully, and you do that. Be thorough, I mean, it means follow every lead. No shortcuts, do ne everything necessary to prove your point. Persevere, do not give up. And so this is kind of his motto in life. And this is something that many of us who went through his lab really try to emulate. And then one thing that he wants to say, he, he always selected problems that were so hard, uh, you know, that almost seemed to be unreachable at the beginning. And yet he eventually got there. And his motto is, if you want to get far, you have to travel along. And so in, it's this, another motto of his was, you, you, you must be modest, except in your aims. And so he, he basically trained people very, very well. And he took great enjoyment in their success. Now, I uh, also, you know, I trained with him. Uh, and I was very fortunate in that he let me be, you know, he basically left me alone. He gave me a problem. Okay, I said, okay, this is yours. And that's it. And so when, when we finished the job, I was very lucky. He did not want to co-author all of the papers that we, I published from there. He, in fact, co-authored only two papers with me on, on, this, on the project that I was working on. And I published about eight or nine other papers that were completely on my own. And he said that you, you did the work, you go on, you just do it on your own. He would look at the papers that I had written and he would give his comments, but that was it. So I was very lucky. So he also basically encouraged his, his mentees, you know, to be independent. And if he thought that, you know, they were independent and, and he, that deserved it, he let them publish on their own. And in my case, I, that was the case. Uh, so I was, Govin was to me extremely friendly, kind and generous at all times. And I'll show you some things before I, I, I'll come back to this. Yeah, here. You leave me notes, you know, uh, like this. This is your Nobel lecture, okay? Copy of the Nobel lecture. Uh, uh, an autograph made for me and said, in admiration and friendship, Govin. Right, so that's, that's so kind he was. And at other times, he was very encouraging. He would, be, he would just leave me random notes. You know, he's, well, our offices were right across from one another in, at MIT. And he would just walk across and leave this note. He said, Tom, you saw the wonderful review of your book in Nature Structural Biology with a question mark, Gobin. And this is, uh, I had uh, Dieter Sol and I, Dieter Sol is another Korana uh, uh, associate, previous Korana associate. Dieter and I, Dieter is at Yale. Dieter and I had published a, a book edited a book rather, uh, called TRNA. And the uh, review of that book came out in Nature Structural Biology. And when he read it, he was so excited that he left me a note. And I had not seen that review, so it was actually, and then I went and read the review and I, 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 I was pleased by it. So that's, so he would leave kind notes like that to me. So, so that was, and this is us, outside the biology building at MIT. So it's, it's been, you know, that's why I have really, the, to me, he's been a tremendous mentor, you know, extremely kind and generous at all times. Now, the other students, yeah, so, so, and he really relished in the successes of his people, people who went through his lab, yeah, like this here, he's shown here, uh, uh, this is at a commencement ceremony, you know, his two students had got their PhDs, um, and, uh, and so this was at the commencement day. And so we have to all you know, dress, of course, uh, uh, appropriately. <laughs> so this, and they got their the degrees. Uh, and then, so this is a, a, a picture taken after the degree. Now this here is about, I don't know how many of you know about the so-called Korana program. Uh, there is a, a program called Korana program here in this country and where interns uh, from India come and spend a summer doing research in different labs in India. And it was all started in Wisconsin uh, uh, by a fellow named Asim Ansari. Asim also came from India uh, to this country and he's established here now. 
uh, Seem Ansari, along with uh, help with the help of uh, authorities at the University of Wisconsin, started this program that would get basically accept students from India to work for three months in, in a lab in Wisconsin. So we have the program is now has gone up to pretty close to 50, I think, a year. It's supported by the Indian government in the sense that they get this, their travel uh, is taken care of by the Indian government. Stipends are taken care of by the, uh, by the host lab here. And it's a very successful program. And one year, uh, I have uh, yeah, there's, there's a whole section on uh, uh, international meetings that are held in Quran, Gobind's honor. But this was a year that there was an international meeting held in Gobind's honor in Wisconsin. Asim and I uh, organized that meeting. And so Gobind was there, of course. But then the Corona interns were also there. And Gobind was the happiest when he was among these interns. Now that all these guys are from India, spending uh, three months here. They will go back to India, finish their degrees. And many of them, in fact, then apply either to the same labs or to the same university or to other different universities in the country to come back and be graduate students for their PhD degrees. And many of them have been accepted. I know several of them have been accepted yeah, in my own department, in the biology department at MIT, and so on and so forth. So this was good to go in a very happy occasion in Wisconsin. And so this is the same one here. So you can see that yeah, he, he was a tremendous, he was a great mentor. And the important thing is that people who went through his lab, I think I will end, I'll, I'll end up with that statement, that people who went through his lab uh, appre really appreciated it and, and felt that they learned something really, really valuable that has literally sustained their own research careers or teaching careers or whatever they have done. That... Okay, now. That, okay, so yeah. yeah, yeah, so that covers also your uh, some of your personal reflections of Dr. Khurana there, so, yes, yeah, so uh, yeah, I know, some more? yeah, no, I think I there are other things that you know, uh, uh -huh. uh, people think it's all work and no play, you know, it's <laughs> not true, and there's a, there's play also, you know, and I think we had we had all kinds of uh, good occasions, like for instance, uh, this is a picture of of a celebration after thesis defense, right? The guy in the middle, uh, Shilda Sarma, had got a PhD and uh, we were uh, joint advisors. Shil had worked on a project of interest to Gobin, but he had to work in my lab. All right, so that's how he became a joint student. And uh, uh, so this is, this is after he had uh, defended his thesis, this is just private uh, celebration. But every one of these would be, you know, like, Every time someone defended the thesis, every time somebody was leaving the lab after being there for a while, you know, there would be a special party in the lab for them. So this so, is uh, an occasion, you know, where this, so that, this, that brings to our next question also. Uh, yeah. I think I'll ask someone uh, to ask you that uh, the, the next question, uh, which is connected <coughs> to this. Yeah. Anyone wants to ask? Yeah, so if not, then I'll ask you. May, that... I, may I ask a question? <coughs> Hello? Yeah, Shantanu. Yes. May, may I ask a question? Ah, yes, tell me. Yeah, my question would be, um, Dr. Rajapandari, that uh, this is this was for many years as a cutting edge science, what he was doing. And as you mentioned, it's extremely challenging. And when we look back also, we find it how hard it was that time. So I assume there would be many failed experiments. So how he used to deal himself with the failed experiments and how he used to uh, treat uh, the students when the experiments are failing repeatedly. Uh, I assume there must be many failures before he went up to that stage. And how he used to motivate in the end the students. Interesting. That, that, that is true. In, in science, you know, you have more failures than successes. Yeah. But I think uh, if you work methodically, carefully, and if you have good ideas, the chances are that you usually succeed. You may make mistakes, right? And so uh, Govin was a religious note keeper. You know, he kept literally notes of everything that he did. So that the advantage of that is that 
if something goes wrong, if the results uh, uh, you know, just don't make sense or things like that, you can always go back and check and see that the, the notes tell you exactly how you, the experiment was done. You can always go, go back and check that. Or you, know, you can take the advice of somebody else. Yeah. And it, uh, it's true that there will be some problems that are just not doable at a particular time. And in that case, you, know, you, you regroup and do what's possible. So there's, there are always decisions that have to be made or that can be made to regroup and do something else. Uh, so, but it's uh, my own experience has been that uh, uh, I, I have always found ways of getting around things. <laughs> or so my, my guys have, been, have found ways of getting around things. So I think that results uh, to some extent that we need to have a very strong bookkeeping uh, absolutely and... absolutely yeah 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 no i think it's 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 sad it's one of the sad things about these days is that we are we're so used to using computers no 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 gobin's i and gobin both have the same philosophy it's gobin's philosophy i learned from him is that everybody nobody who will leave their notebooks behind so that's all about science but now we will actually try to take away from science and how was he outside the lab? And how did he take up uh, his acceptance, uh, his um, partition that he's away from his home uh, hometown and then he's actually settled in US? How did he take up that particular challenge also there? Yeah, okay. So let me, let me tell you something about outside the lab. So the, the lab is really like a family. Yeah, in the sense that uh, you have life uh, outside of the lab. And so uh, the lab functions as a unit. So Gobin would, and, and it was something that we have parties in the lab, you know, to celebrate things, people coming, people going, people succeeding and all that stuff. Or sometimes, you know, if, if on a Friday night, we'll all go out, you know, just look, uh, just uh, MIT has a place we can go all go to and just have a, have a, have a, have a beer or something. Or, or sodas, <laughs> I shouldn't just say beer, uh, uh, whatever. And, and you know, it's, that's what the, the group, somehow it's, the important thing in the lab is bonding within the group. And that is, is, it strengthens the bond, you know, to be able to, uh, to spend time outside together. Yeah, and so we did a lot of that. I mean, Friday nights, we would do the same. You know, he brought it from England, I brought it from England too. I spent many years in England myself, so. Uh, that's one thing. And the other thing is that, you know, he also loved challenges. So uh, uh, what we do is annually, uh, uh, I'll have people in my, in, in, uh, in my house uh, and we just eat, you know, we just have party you know, outside, outside the house, you know, cook outside and just gathering. And we have big enough space, fortunately, to do that. And so we'll have the two groups together. Uh, I think I'm going to show you some slides later on about the two groups um, uh, in, a, in a minute or so, just for a minute or so. Yeah. So now Govin loved volleyball. So one thing is that, you know, so he, this is him, you know, this, now, this was a place, Govin had a place, a cabin, cabin in a place called New Hampshire, about two hours drive from Boston. And we would all drive to Boston on a nice day like this from Boston, two hours up, up. And then we would, Govin would put up this and, you know, it would be volleyball. Like, you know, like he, he's playing, he's here, very keen on volleyball. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, some of them already have gone for a walk up uh, to the mountain <laughs> or, or someplace, but he's playing volleyball here. So that's what we do. And then here we are hiking up a mountain again, Gobin is here somewhere. Yeah. Here somewhere, right? We, we're hiking up a mountain, you know, and even children are, are, are there too. You know, the families can bring children and all that stuff. So that's how the bonding, you know, uh, goes, uh, bonding within the lab. And, and, and then the other thing, yeah, outside the lab. Now, this is Arthur Kornberg and Paul Berg, right? There were international meetings held in honor of Govind at many, many places, particularly at places where he went through. And this is Vancouver. He had gone through Vancouver in, nine, in the 50s. 1952 to 60 was his days in Vancouver. 
Now, this is 1993. There was a, the people in Vancouver had a meeting in his honor, Gobind's honor, scientific meeting, international meeting. These meetings usually last three to five days, depending on where it is, right? The, so the three to five days, and many, many people are invited. And in this case, Arthur and Paul were invited. They were here. And this is now a, 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 some kind of a party going on in the, uh, in the middle of the afternoon uh, here, out in the uh, lawn of where the meeting was being held. Arthur and Paul again. And these two guys had been the guys who came to his lab when he was, he had a lab in Vancouver and learned to make DNA uh, nucleotides. And uh, uh, Paul learned to make amino acid uh, adenylates. He was, Paul was working on tRNAs then. So, so this is now, this is uh, like, uh, uh, so it becomes a, way of, for the Qurana family to regather. Every, all the me previous members of Qurana group are invited to these. So we see each other every so often. In fact, the last such meeting was held in Chandigarh in 2017, uh, was held in Chandigarh because the people in Punjab felt that this was the only place where Govind had gone through that had not had a scientific meeting in his honor. So we, we, had, we had a meeting in Sunday year 2017 after Govind passed away. So this is the example. So a, a kind of tight bond also among scientists that you establish and how you can basically learn from one another. Govind's idea that he would really switch from chemistry to biochemistry to biology really came from meeting people like these guys. They would come and work to learn to make the things that Gobin had learned to make. And then at the same time, give seminars during lunch, always during lunch, uh, 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 doing seminars about their own work. And their own work really uh, convinced Gobin that he really should not move to bi biology. And in fact, you know, his DNA polymerase was used by Gobin to make um, all short oligonucleotides into long DNAs. And his RNA polymerase was used by Gobin to make those to convert that, those DNAs into RNA, messenger RNA. So that's how the fruitful these interact, kinds of interactions can, scientific interactions can be. Okay. And now this is uh, Gobin and Arthur, Gobin visiting Arthur's house in, at Stanford University. And just, they were just uh, fooling around <laughs> basically. Now, they were guests uh, uh, in the room, but so, so that's the house, the bonds of friendship between scientists can be. And this is a very interesting story. Now, this is the Wisconsin meeting. Again, I mentioned to you that this is another international meeting held in Gobin's honor. Asim and I organized it. Uh, and this was, uh, uh, this fellow is a fellow named Julius Adler. Uh, Julius was a very, very, very well-known scientist. He, he established the field of chemotaxis, basically. Uh, and so good friend of Ju Gobin's, he was, Julius has been in the biochemistry department at Wisconsin ever since he went there, he, he got his PhD there. And so good friends. And when Gobin got the Nobel Prize, Julius had a, a party at his house, a champagne party. So this is a bottle of champagne that is that, that saved from that time. It's empty, but it had got the names and the dates and something written in here. So when we had the meeting in 2009 there, Julius gave us another party, this time a dinner party. And so Gobin and I, when many of us were there, and at, after the dinner, Julius brought out that bottle to show to Gobin to remember that for the Nobel Day when you know, they drank from that, from that bottle. Uh, so this is basically it. So this again, you know, it's non-science, but it's friendship, but it's really science-based uh, friendship, really. Now, the one thing that I wanted to say is, let me, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Banerjee, are yes. we going, uh, uh, is it okay, time-wise? Yeah, yeah, you can, yeah, you can go ahead. Uh. Yeah, so let me show you uh, one or two slides that I missed because this is, just to give you, okay, give a feel, for, okay. So this is the first paper he published, right? And this is the group in Eteha that he went to, all right? The, this is the Vladimir Prelog's group. His first postdoctoral work spent for a year and this is Gobind here. Right. Yeah, yeah. And it, so that, and then he, Cambridge. I don't have anything from Cambridge, but Vancouver, Cambridge. I also the, the 
Cambridge also has another collection. The person I did my PhD with, Jim Badley, was a friend of Gobin's because Jim Badley did his PhD with uh, Alexander Todd. Uh, so there was a connection. Uh, okay, so, we, so there's this thing called Nobel Tree <laughs> that people have, you know, Todd, uh, uh, Gobin, <laughs> uh, and all that stuff. So, uh, so there's a connection between uh, Jim and uh, Jim Badley, Sir James Badley, and, uh, and Gobin. They, they, were, they were in the same lab together. Okay, so this is Mike Smith, the, uh, the postdoctoral associate of Govin, who eventually went on to win the Nobel Prize uh, in 1990 something. Yeah, and this is the group in Vancouver. Yeah, and here, here is a guy who is visiting from Denmark, uh, Hans Hans Klena. Uh, okay, and I'll tell you one more story that you don't know. This is John Moffat. Okay, I told, told you that uh, uh, Gorbin became famous for synthesizing coenzymes, right? Well, my PhD thesis in Wisconsin was, in, in, in England, was to synthesize coenzyme A. Yeah, and I was close to the end, but not at the end. But when I read a paper on synthesis of coenzyme A, published by John Moffat and Karan. Uh, so this is John Moffat here. I, I just highlight him here. Yeah, John. Yeah. So he was the guy who beat me to it, basically. Yeah, so that's another connection. Now, this is the a group in Wisconsin. Now, you can see that the Gobin had a group, big, much bigger group here in Wisconsin, about 20, 24, yeah, about 20 people. Yeah. And then uh, the group in, uh, at MIT, now this is one year. We had the, another thing that we did, we had annual pictures every year. I have a complete list of pictures from every year of our life together in the lab. And so this is the uh, 1980s, this is 1985 it was, I think. And so that, there are my, there's a, these are mixtures of my group and his group, yeah. And then, okay, so this is what we didn't go through. Okay, so this is how he made very short oligonucleotides, TC, 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 or AG, 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 and the two strands that come together, T to A and A to C to G. Then you make DNA polymer, you add DNA polymerase, and you make long DNA, you add RNA polymerase, and you make long RNA, messenger RNA, and you then add it to a protein synthesizing system in the test tube, and you make protein. And so based on the, the RNA that you added, and the uh, protein that you got, you can get, you can decide what codes for what. That was the beginning. That was Korana's approach to the solid solution of the genetic. One of these approaches to solution of the genetic code, solving the genetic code. Yeah. So he made this is repeating two nucleotides TC TC TC. Then he made repeating three nucleotides TAC 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 TAC, or repeating four nucleotides, and then you could do that. And you, you just the systematic, you know. That's one thing about yeah. Another thing about systematic, always systematic. So and so, uh, and so, so I think you know the lesson that I really want people to get from this is that virtually none of us are geniuses. None of us went, you know, very few of us went to Oxford or Cambridge or whatever have you, and yet you know we strive to succeed. You know, we strive to do whatever we can and strive to do the best in whatever we do. And it's possible to, and Gobin showed that it's possible to do that. All right, now, now, I, now I think the last thing I want to say. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, yeah. Uh, is, is, is basically his legacy. On the occasion of the Corona Nobel Prize, one of the guys from Vancouver, Gordon Tanner, I should have pointed out to you, said, he showed us what excellence in science was and we'll learn to recognize it. That was his comment on when Gobin got the Nobel Prize, you know. Even though they were disappointed that he didn't get it while he was in Vancouver. <laughs> but, yeah. And since then, you know, generations of scientists have come by and gone through his lab. They made their mark, they learned from him, his philosophy in science, learned from him what to do, what not to do in science and all that stuff. And they have gone and they have now are estab well established on their own uh, at, in, at institutions throughout the world uh, and doing a very, very good job 
and they at you know, their heads of departments or very famous well-known scientists or whatever have you and so the the legacy of Karana lives on in these guys so the legacy of Gobind Karana lives on and uh, I think you know even now you know I, I certainly get emails I, I, I can call anybody and know that it's a, it's part of the family that that was a wonderful journey that you have taken uh, taken us around so i think uh, the the feedback that you are actually getting in the chat box also is phenomenal there i think <laughs> many, of, many of the fair facets which possibly uh, many of us actually did not knew about professor kurana i think you have literally covered many of those aspects there i just i cannot uh, uh, i uh, find words to thank you enough that i don't know how to, how i can appreciate you on on this particular occasion that uh, you have taken enough time to uh, uh, tell about professor khurana and even with the equal excitement it's almost one and a half hours now and i can see that you have to have done the entire lecture at this age without drinking water there <laughs> <laughs> so, that's i i i i can that also tells you that how deeply you you and professor khurana were bonded to that you feel so much so excited to talk about him there so uh, we, with these words i think i uh, we must thank uh, uh, you uh, unless you have to add anything sir well i i'm i'm, I'm sure i've forgotten many things but you know i uh, yeah yeah I, yeah i think I've, i've gone through this stuff yeah i think uh yeah yes yeah. so i just want to point out gordon tenor was tenor was the guy who yeah. gordon tenor this is gordon tenor he right. was the guy who said he, he showed us what excellence in science was and we learned to recognize it he was the first postdoc gobin had mm -hmm. first postdoc professor the first person he hired when he went to vancouver he was a professor there for many 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 years at the university of british columbia Uh, so Moffat became yeah yeah, yeah. sorry uh, here i think uh, people will also have a lot of uh, questions to ask you uh, <coughs> but i think um, we uh, we will have to call it a day uh, because i uh, i i don't know how many of you are aware because uh, professor raj bhandari looks very young but i think you are not aware of of his age there <laughs> <He is, laughs> So uh can I reveal your age sir? Yes, he is he is 87 now and I I can uh, one can really imagine that at the 87 <laughs> years of age he's so excited to speak and he is so excited to really continue to follow. so when I had initially uh, discuss, uh, discussed about this particular issue <clears throat> he said that for me one hour two hours is not a, not an issue at all I can speak even for three hours there when it comes to professor Kurana there. So uh so that is his excitement about uh, professor kurana and one day we definitely we will possibly try to have a, a physical uh, a meeting also <laughs> if time permits we we'll love to have you back in india sometime whenever the time permits and wish you all a very good health so with these words i uh, i would uh, ask uh, uh, my uh, colleague to give her vote of thanks so samyukta yeah thank you sir thank you so much that you found time out of your busy schedule to sit through and share your valuable experiences and precious memories today we got to know many unknown facets in the life of the visionary scientist professor khurana and you let us walk through his uh, determination perseverance motivation and accomplishments thank you so much sir for honoring us with your presence we are extremely grateful thank you sir well well it's been a pleasure to to really talk to you and to chat with you and and talk about uh, my dear friend yeah so i should also mention that i just retired 4 months ago so <laughs> yeah i i i gave my last class in in may this year so 
Professor Raj. Well, it was wonderful uh, experience with you. And we had series of discussions uh, to literally go how to go forward. <coughs> and I think you had been, every time you had been very phenomenal there. Uh, yes. so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor.